はい。John, do you know? I guess、um, I can't really see how many people have already logged on, but just let me know.、Uh, yeah, there's 10 people in the room now. Okay. Maybe we'll give it a couple more minutes before we get started. Because I do want to be mindful of everybody's、um, hour that they're spending today. Do we have a little bit more people that、um, joined us, John? Maybe 15?、Uh, not yet. Okay, we'll get to, maybe we can get to about, you know, just give it a, one more minute. Okay. I have about 12.02, so I think we will get started. Again, I want to remind everyone that this is this CME activity is jointly provided by the Queens Medical Center and UH Jabsom Department of Geriatric Medicine. And、uh, as a kind reminder, will everyone please complete the evaluation forms? At this time, please enter the name and credentials of. Everyone viewing our geriatric echo for CME attendance purposes.、Um, evaluations are required if you want to receive the CMEs, and you can find evaluations by following the link in the chat or at any time on our website and email advertisement. Your comments are very important to the planning committee, and it will be used to plan for future, future programs. So, I just want to give a little brief overview, overview again about ECHO. We want to remind everyone that this is an ECHO webinar. This means that the session serves as a forum for mutual teaching and learning from experts and from each of us on the front lines. As the ECHO motto goes, all teach, all learn. So, it will take all of you to create this community of learning. How our format works for this hour is that there is a short lecture from our expert. We will share expertise from the rest of the interdisciplinary team and then open the time up for case discussions by all participants. We invite you to share any geriatric cases. It may even be on a topic not related to the topic of today's lecture. I'm pleased to introduce our interdisciplinary team at this point,、uh, which includes Ms. Mary Gadam. She's a retired nurse with the State Department of Health. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Sarah Tompkinson. I am a social worker.、Uh, Chad Kawakami is our pharmacist,、uh, who's currently on military leave, and he's affiliated with the University of Hawaii's University, it's Hilo. Hilo University、uh, Pharmacy Program. And lastly,、um, I would like to welcome Dr. Lucas Morgan, who is a, a practicing、uh, psychologist. He's in private practice with,、uh, I hope I say this right, Ilani Counseling Center. So now I have the great privilege of being able to introduce our speaker.、Um, oh, I also forgot to mention that. Can we also try to remember that if we are going to share cases, that we remain HIPAA compliant?、Um, so, I'd like to introduce today's speaker.、Um, it, our speaker today is Dr. Aida Wen. She is an associate professor with the Department of Geriatric Medicine at the John A. Burns School of Medicine with the University of Hawaii. She is also the program director of the Geriatric Medicine Fellowship. Program and she's a geriatrician that works for the Queen's Health Systems. She serves as a medical director at a nursing facility. I really don't know where Aida finds the time to sleep. 
because uh, she, in addition to all those things, she's the founder and currently the vice president of the Hawaii Medical Directors Association. She is board certified in geriatrics and palliative care. And she also serves as a consultant for Aloha Care's health plan in the division of long-term services and support. She presently is the PI, the private, um, I guess, uh, in principal yeah. investigator for the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. And through her role in several educational grants, she's developed a wide network of collaborations, partnerships, community stakeholders, and even family caregivers, caregivers who care for our elderly population. And she continues to be a strong advocate for improving geriatric and dementia care while striving to help patients and providers help our seniors age as gracefully as possible. Thank you, Dr. Wen. Thank you very much for that introduction. All right, well, let's go ahead and see what we're up against. Whoops, wait, how do I forward the slides here? Okay, yeah, so today our topic is the art of managing multi-morbidity. And uh, for you, many of you who take care of older adults, you know this is an art, right, more than a science. And so, you know, I'm gonna provide some guiding principles for managing uh, older adults with multiple chronic conditions. Okay, so the objectives today, right, is to know what the definition of multi-morbidity is and the problems associated with it and know why most clinical practice guidelines are not appropriate for older adults with multimorbidity. Uh, we'll talk about the five guiding principles for evaluating older adults with multimorbidity and know how to use e-prognosis as a resource. So let's start with this question. What comes to mind when you hear the word multimorbidity? You can just chime in. We are a small little intimate group. You can chime in or chat in the box. What do you think about when you hear the word multimorbidity? Super sick. Do I hear any groans? Multiple diagnosis, yeah. Multiple docs, yeah, that's right. Multiple diagnoses, multiple docs, a lot of coordination. What else were we thinking? Money, right? High utilizers. They're very expensive. And they're, what do you see? What do you expect? Their med list to be really long, right? Oh my gosh, yeah, most of my patients. Challenging, daunting. Frustrating, yeah. And you also think, oh, it's gonna take time. Oh, I don't know, this is a complicated admission, right? I also think decreased quality of life, right? Goals, yeah. And I, I worry about the caregivers too, right? Because I know, uh-oh, we're gonna have some really, um, Caregivers with a lot of burnout and needs and questions, right? So yeah, so you're right. It that's what comes to mind, right? We have multiple chronic conditions. This, you know, impacts on death, disability. There's adverse treatment effects, right? High use, complexity, interactions, multiple medications, difficult decision making, challenging caregivers, needing care coordinators, lots of them right? Frailty, disability, vulnerability, and quality of life is at stake. So very complex cases. So there, there must be an approach to this, right? So, so yeah, when we went to, you know, medical school, we went to school, nurse practitioner school, what we learned about clinical practice guidelines. I said, oh, this is what we do. How do we take care of people with diabetes? This is how we take care of people with heart disease. This is how we take care of people with COPD. But the problem is, is that most of these clinical practice guidelines only focus on one disease, right? And 
it's, so it's, it's not representative. And then older adults with multimorbidity, they're not even included in clinical trials because it would make the study too complicated. No, so that, that they're excluded. And then even, you know, trying to implement the clinical-based practice guidelines, they're just impractical or irrelevant and maybe even harmful. And so we really have to be um, very mindful of this. When we look at clinical practice guidelines, it doesn't mean to throw them out the window, but it means that we know we need to um, take a lot more things into account, right? Um, yeah. And the other thing that complicates things is that patients are individuals, right? They're not textbooks. And they're all different. Everybody has different illness severity. So see, all one CHF is not the same as everybody else's. Some have more severe than others. Functional status is different. Some people are a little more robust going in, right? They were athletic before, and so they are still quite functional. Or they may have different prognoses from their other comorbidities. They have personal priorities, right? And um, different people have risk for adverse events in different de varying degrees. So, yeah, so how do we approach multi-morbidity? So fortunately, the American Geriatric Society created this clinical tool. And so if you go to Geriatrics Care Online, uh, you can actually pull up a whole bunch of geriatric evaluation and management tools. And they uh, actually have a really nice two-page summary on this. But, you know, so today I'm actually going to talk a little bit about this approach and we'll use um, five guiding principles. And that's what I'm going to walk through today. So here they are. These are the five guiding principles. So we have this clinical practice guidelines, but then we have to take patient preferences into account. We have to interpret the evidence with a grain of salt, right? Think about prognosis. Think about feasibility and think about how can we optimize therapies and care plans in the big picture. And the thing I wanted to just, uh, just note here is that there's no set sequence for this. It doesn't matter what order you take this in, in, but you should be systematically looking at each of these things and seeing, does this apply to my patient? So, uh, Jerry, uh, so guiding principle number one is patient preferences, you know, um, patient-centered care, right? That is really, uh, really important in, in geriatric care. Um, so, yeah, so what does that mean? It means to elicit and incorporate patient preferences into medical decision-making. Um, and that care provided according to the clinical practice guidelines may not adequately address individual preferences. And so patients should have the opportunity to evaluate their choices and prioritize with their preferences of care within their personal and cultural uh, context. So a really important question to ask, a really helpful question to ask is at this stage in your life, what matters most to you? Um, it could be something as simple as my dog, right? And then you you create your care plan revolving around that thing that matters the most to them. So, so, so for example, this is the case ex example is that, you know, 80 year old woman with atrial fibrillation, she has an indication for warfarin by traditional agrim. So, you know, we follow the guidelines, she should be prescribed warfarin, but she does not wish to have regular blood monitoring. She doesn't feel safe taking the newer anticoagulants. And she understands the trade-offs and then she just decides, you know what, I'm just going to take daily aspirin, right? So that's, that's what we mean by patient preferences, allowing them to make those um, personal decisions. You know, she might be one of those people who just have a big fear of needles, right? And don't want to get to the lab that, that many times a week. Okay. Oh no, what happened? What is this? Okay, um, okay. Principle number two, interpreting the evidence. Recognize that there are significant evidence gaps concerning condition and treatment interactions, particularly in older adults with multimorbidity. So we have to interpret the medical literature specifically for the population. 
Um, so we have to ask, does this information apply to my patient that I'm talking about? So here's another case example, an 84 year old man with hyperlipidemia, with, he has no history of any vascular events, neither cardiac, cerebral or peripheral. He's been on a statin for the last 12 years. And you look at the evidence and you advise him that he can stop taking the statin if he wishes because there's no evidence, there's lack of evidence that he will benefit from this medicine in primary prevention. Right, so you have to interpret the data a bit, not. Okay, and then there's guiding principle number three, prognosis. We need to frame those management decisions within the context of risk benefits burdens and prognosis. So the question, the key question is, is time to benefit longer than the life expectancy, right? So when we discuss prognosis, we really need to take into account how much time, what's your life expectancy? And what is, and the impact of functional status and quality of life uh, with that prognosis. Uh, we need to facilitate decision-making and advanced care planning and address preferences and treatment rationale and thinking about how do we prioritize the, uh, the care plan and the treatments that we, um, and are they gonna you know, have time to benefit from it? So for example, like here's a 79 year old woman with diabetes, congestive heart failure, stage four kidney disease, and her daughter is pushing her to get a re her regular colonoscopy, but she's reluctant. And using this e-prognosis tool, which we'll go over in detail later, her provider finds that her estimated life expectancy is less than 10 years. And therefore she is not likely to experience overall benefit from screening colonoscopy, right? So is that time to benefit longer than the life expectancy? Okay, um, guiding principle number four, feasibility. So consider, is this, how complex is this? Is this even feasible? right? So the more complex a treatment regimen is, the more likely there's going to be non-adherence, adverse reactions, impaired quality of life, costly, uh, create caregiver strain, and have to, people might have depression. So this, this uh, requires ongoing and more thoughtful approach to education and assessment, because you have to figure out, wait, can this patient and family even do this? Like, is this feasible? So case example, an 87 year old man complains of fatigue and he feels like he's taking too many medications. He has dementia, heart failure, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, insomnia, diabetes, and prostate disease. And all in all, he has 16 medications, which, and he often forgets to take his evening doses and he does not monitor his blood glucose. So you discuss it with the patient and the daughter and you decide to stop five of his medications based on his priorities, modify the times of administration so it can be done at a time that the family can remind him or help him take the medicines and then recommend a pill box as an extra cue. Yeah. Oh, and I see Renata has a comment. It should also incorporate the family's need to know for their own health. Yeah, that's true. That's, I think, talking about the previous, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, can this patient even do this? Like, and is the family, can the family help even? Okay. And then, guiding principle number five, right? Optimizing therapies and care plans. So, we need to choose therapies that maximize benefit, minimize harm, and enhance quality of life. So we need to consider if there are too many meds, right? And maybe if we reduce this polypharmacy, um, we might lower the risk of having drug interactions. That makes a lot of sense. You know, interestingly, there's also a phenomenon where people are taking too few meds. They don't wanna take medications. And so they're actually not optimally managed, right? Um, having high risk. So that might need to be discussed as well. Maybe we can reduce some other meds and add the ones that actually matter. So there might be suboptimal medication use or the interventions might be too burdensome. And, and I, I like the, the fact that you, even non-pharmacologic interventions could be very, very burdensome, right? In, and more burdensome than beneficial if it's not consistent with their preferences, right? I've certainly had family members continually take their Parkinson's 
patient, their, their family members to physical therapy and to the gym and on and on. And the, the patient doesn't want it. <laughs> it's too much for them. It makes them really tired. They don't want it. It's a burdensome intervention. Sure, it'll help them stay mobile, but they don't want it, right? So that, that, that can be um, overly burdensome too. So we have to ask, you know, does this regimen care plan enhance quality of life? So another case example. So the 92 year old widowed man with advanced dementia returns to the care of a daughter, to the daughter after hospitalization for systolic heart failure. The cardiologist proposed implanting um, an AICD, which is a cardiac defibrillator. But the daughter points out that her father has intense anxiety, won't even leave the house. So you ask her if her father, if able to speak for himself, would choose such an invasive intervention designed only to prolong life, right? So this is that getting at that question. Is this, you know, intervention overly burdensome uh, for him? Does he even want it because it, it's cause, going to cause him int if it, intense anxiety? Okay, so, okay, so I wanted to take this time to, I don't know how many of you, have you heard of e-prognosis? I'm curious. Uh, anybody here? Okay, I don't see any hands raised or any comments. So yes, yes, some of you have, yes. Okay. Okay, so I will just go through this a little bit. So it's it's really a fantastic resource. So um, it, it was actually produced by um, a bunch of researchers, uh, geriatricians uh, and palliative care docs over at UCSF, UC San Francisco. Um, and um, they, they actually took a whole bunch of, uh, I guess, uh, prognostic um, uh, tools and like put them in a very user-friendly way. And, um, and, and then, um, so I'm gonna walk through some of this. So, so this is the um, calculators where you could actually click on, oh, if this one, if my patient is out in the community living at home and comes to your clinic, you know, these, this, these are the tools that you might use. If, if your patient is in a nursing home setting, these, this is the, the tool you would use. If they're in the hot, they're hospitalized. This is one, and then under hospice. So based on setting, you have different prognostic tools. And so this, the purpose of this is to estimate the risk of mortality and disability by setting. Another uh, going here. So moving from calculus, if we go to cancer screening tab, right? There's different um, uh, uh, screening for different cancer, and you could actually click on that as well. Um, and we can look at that later. And then this one, if you go to the next decision under decision tools, if you click under there, there is actually a time to benefit. And what happens is that you can use this orange slider, you click on it and you move it back and forth and you sort of see that, oh, if a person has two years to live, uh, estimated prognosis, then they you know, would benefit or not benefit uh, from a variety of things. And we can look at that later too. And um, another one, another tab under ePrognosis is communication tab. And so some, you know, these discussions are actually really hard to do. They're, they're very complicated. Um, so sometimes having examples, this, so these are example discussions. So they just give you uh, a little video clips and then there's some communication skills on uh, little tips for communication skills under the communication tab. Okay, so um, okay, so let's see. I am going to go here. Okay, so we'll sort of um, walk through this a little bit with this case example. So, yeah, Mrs. R. L. Miss R. L. She's an 83 year old woman. She had been uh, living in her own home, uh, two story home, with her family. Um, no, sorry, she lives on her own in a two-story home and her family members rotate to stay with her and a sister. So I, I've seen this happen so many times, right? Mom doesn't wanna move out and move in with the kids. Instead, the kids have to rotate and take turns 
coming to visit them. And sometimes I've had families, they come from out of state. Oh, it's my week. So I got to fly back home and spend time with mom, right? So it can be kind of tricky, but they, they want to help her live at home as long as possible. That's her priority there. She has two daughters and two sons. The more kids you have, the better, I guess. Okay, and here's her past medical history. She has dementia with periods of delusion and aggression. She has a history of malignant liposarcoma of the right thigh, which was resected and felt to be cured. She has um, high blood pressure. She has generalized arthritis and therefore chronic pain. She has irritable bowel syndrome and therefore lots of recurrent GI symptoms, constipation and diarrhea and alternating in between. Um, hyperlipidemia, her cholesterol is up, her heart disease and CHF and osteoporosis. So let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? At least nine medical problems here. And so, yeah, so who wants to take a guess how many meds she's on? Could be a lot of meds, right? Because she's got at least eight or nine problems, right? Okay, so let's take a look. Oh, actually, it doesn't, turns out she's not on a lot of meds, right? She's on citalopram, quetiapine, Tylenol, Lasix, KCL, potassium supplement, and melatonin. And I point this out because you'll note that some health issues are not actually even addressed here, right? What is being addressed here? Right? What is being addressed here? The things that contribute to her quality of life, right? Like, so she has, so what matters to this person with lady with dementia? So pain matters, right? So she's on Tylenol. Uh, CHF matters. So that's why she's on the Lasix and the potassium, right? And the melatonin matters for sleep. And then these are for her behaviors because otherwise her family can't keep her at home, right? Because she's just too anxious. So, you know, so really the guiding principles here is that actually it's okay not to address every single health issue um, because, because of what matters to her, right? It's patient preferences. So yeah, so she's not on a statin and she's not on aspirin and she's not in calcium, vitamin D or bisphosphonates and she's not on, and the hypertension, you know, we, we, we just limit her salt intake, right? So yeah, and then the other thing that is guiding her, her treatment regimen is clinical feasibility, right? Because um, it, maybe it's hard for her to swallow that many pills. And too many pills, how many, too many times a day, it might be overly burdensome for the family too. And maybe she just complains all the time about taking pills and you don't want to, you know, deal with that every day. So, yeah, so these are two of the principles that uh, we have here. Oh, and cost, right? Sleep and mood is what's important to her, right? And cost. Very good. Okay. So what happens? So as she, maybe one year later, she has worsening agitation and aggression, difficulty with care at home, and, and actually now she's going to a daycare center and she's having difficulty there as well. And so finally they, they, can't, they can't handle anymore. And so they admit her to a med psych unit to optimize her care, to adjust her medicines. And then if they can adjust her medicines, she can go back home, right? And then continue to stay home as much as possible. So they, they, they tried that, right? Uh, unfortunately, she uh, developed severe respiratory symptoms and is hospitalized in January. And she also has abdominal distension. So this, she's developed a number of medical uh, problems. So now we have to make some decisions like, well, what is, well, let's think about what is her prognosis? Because that matters uh, to where she might go, right? Mm -hmm. So what is her, so we could go to e-prognosis and look under hospital setting and they've chosen this, uh, there's this Walter index 
Uh, there's the English tool. You can pick Spanish, French, and Portuguese, I guess. And answer the risk calculator. So what's their biological sex, female, you know, what does she need in terms of ADLs? And then does she have any cancer? Um, what is their creatinine? What is their admission albumin? And so on and so on. And so you fill out this uh, calculator and then lo and behold, out pops a score. And she gets a score of four to six. And they say that her risk of one year mortality is 34%. So if her one year mortality is uh, 34%, then the value of treating conditions with benefit later on right? That's the one we, things that we were talking about, like treating osteoporosis, right? Uh, hyperlipidemia, coronary disease is not really that helpful, right? And turns out that, you know, um, yeah, so we have to take that into account. Like, well, actually her prognosis is not that great. So what should we do? Well, things did get worse for her. It turns out she actually tested positive for influenza. She was started on ulcetamivir. Her x-ray showed pseudo obstruction of the bowel and all the stool studies were negative. She had hypokalemia that was hard to treat. She just had a very rocky course at the hospital. Eventually she kind of sort of discharged home, but she was back in the hospital after 48 hours. And she continued to have abdominal pain and hypokalemia. She just wasn't managing well. So she went to the skilled nursing facility. More agitation, more frustration, more health problems, lost weight. Her quality of life is poor. And so what do you think, right? Her prognosis is getting worse. And what is her prognosis? And so if you go to ePrognosis, you can click on the nursing home setting. It's different from the hospital setting calculators, right? And so they, they chose this index. And so you kind of click um, all the different uh, calculator things here and you hit calculate risk. And turns out that she is actually over here. Her score is 16.1. She's kind of very close to this part, very, very high. And her six month mortality, it's, it's not a one year mortality, 30%. This is now six month mortality of 34%. So she is, um, not doing well at all. And maybe we really need to transition the focus of patient care, right, to comfort care um, because of her high mortality. Might even, I don't know, would you even think about hospice? You need to start probably talking about it, even if you don't sign on right away, um, because things are, 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 are declining. Uh, this allows us to talk about her poor, poor prognosis openly with the family, right? And thinking about the limited benefits of hospital care. Maybe she should be a do not hospitalize. Um, the decisions are tough and we have to gain consensus among family, uh, adult children. And But ultimately, you know, they they still so committed, right? They, they went through a lot and they still got her home, right? So they decided for comfort care at home. So this, again, they're looking at preferences again, comfort care at home. Um, and as ha what happens sometimes, you got stabilized at home with palliative care approach. And um, quite a number of months go by and she's not declining. She's kind of stabilized for a while. So the family is now thinking, well, I don't know if we can do this for another six months. This is a lot of intensive care and causing a lot of anxiety among the family members. And so um, eventually they readmit her to the nursing facility for respite care and for, I guess, uh, and maybe even uh, hospice at the uh, nursing facility. But they still want her to come home at some point. So they, if she has, you know, final days and it's looking like then maybe we can deal with it for a little while. So they're thinking about final return home for, return home for final days because her pre preference is to die at home. Yeah, so I am going to end that. Okay.
And yeah, I wanted to pull up ePrognosis and um, show that to you. Where is that? Hold on, I have to do the share screen. There. There, you see that? That's the ePrognosis that we were talking about. And so, yeah, if you go to the calculators main, you can see this is the main page for the calculators that we showed over there. And there's a list. If you, There's actually a lot of different people have done research and these are the, uh, the different calculators uh, for living in the community, people living in the nursing home, people who are hospitalized, um, one year mortality, two year mortality, and if they've been seen by palliative care. So there's a lot of different calculators. Cancer screening, you know, if you click on colorectal cancer, you know, you can think about how old is your patient, your gender, your BMI, what describes their general health, right? Do they have chronic lung disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes? Do they have difficulty walking a quarter mile? And then you can kind of calculate the risk, right? Okay, so I'm gonna exit that, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's helpful for the decision aids. I just wanted to show you that actually, so there's, um. There's a lot of decision aids that you can share with uh, patients, but this is the time to benefit thing that we were showing you before. So after you've calculated the mortality, uh, then you can sort of slide this tool and say, oh, if a person has six months to live, they probably, um, yeah, they, they would benefit from maybe hospice admission, um, maybe not so much not recommended for intensive blood control, maybe no statins. Uh, finasteride is uh, uh, probably not gonna be helpful in this time frame. and bisphosphonates or intensive glycemic control, right? Even intensive glycemic control is probably not that beneficial eight, nine years down the road. Um, colorectal screening, right? 10 years or so. Uh, mammography, 11 years and things like that. So this is just uh, the risk benefit um, calculated decision tools. And then this is the communication tab where you can um, think about how you might, and then there's these little videos and steps and you can practice these phrases, right? And little tips. So um, yeah, so that's, that's what I, I wanted to show you. And then I just wanted to kind of open it up um, for any discussions um, or cases or challenging things we can talk about. Oh, Sarah's asking, how was, oh, our, our eyes quality of life affected by the multiple transitions of care between home hospital sniff? Yeah, good question, right? I think probably, she uh, was miserable and it made her anxious. Transitions often make people with dementia super anxious. Normal, every day, you know, we may be able to recognize this is a hospital put up for a while, right? But uh, if you have dementia, you don't really understand it. And it's kind of that in and of itself can be. And that's really, you made a, raise a very good point. That's something I talk to families about all the time. Yeah. Do people have, uh, this is basically the geriatric approach, right? Meaning that it's that art of trying to balance all of the different uh, uh, domains, the guiding principles. So, yeah. Any, any uh, comments or experiences that you want to share? Um, um, or nightmare stories. <laughs> I just had one comment that I really think I needed that geriatricians, you know, it's, 
it really is such a unique field and it takes a special kind of person. So for all the geriatricians out there, you know, just thank you for what you do for our, um, our, our Kupuna population because it takes a lot of patience time, lots of time, very labor intensive. Uh, I think also, yeah, there's a skill set that geriatricians have to, to have that um, compassion and, and just takes time <laughs> and, and to be non-judgmental and comprehensive. So thanks to the geriatricians and people in geriatrics in general. Yeah, well, this is just an approach and geriatricians aren't everywhere. And I really would like all providers everywhere, primary care physicians, hospitalists too, right? Nursing home providers, all those PALTC providers, right? Uh, everybody to really take this approach um, when we um, take care of our patients. It's, it's not, and, and you know, one of the things, because it's so complicated, I mean, that's why we need partners. That's why I rely on those nurses, right? And the social workers, right? And people who really, you know, know the patients. Or, you know, somebody who can really, if it's hard for, you know, me or I don't have time to have that advanced care directive discussion, right? Maybe uh, several people can, right? And we can mutually reinforce that discussion over time. Oh, Lucas says, I second that. Thank you, folks. It's such a good model. Compassionate, not afraid of complexity, integrative and patient-centered for all providers. Renata, I saw your question too about why is it that the elderly are so it's moving in with their children other than the obvious? And are there elder issues that younger folks don't know or address? I, I don't know if it's um, age specific, but it is for sure one, the loss of independence. I know for a lot of times adult children want to do the best, um, but part of their perception of what's best is then taking on the role of the parent. And so, and maybe Lucas can sort of add to that, but then there's quite a bit of conflict because there's power struggles that happen. So it is, it is viable, but there has to be open communication where um, the expectations between the parent that's moving in with their son or daughter um, clearly understands, you know, both ways, how, how they're gonna, how they're gonna share the kitchen, <laughs> you know, or, take take responsibility for cooking whatever that may be i don't know does anybody else have yeah lucas, lucas <laughs> has a comment of course yeah hi yeah and great question and it's such a complex issue as folks have already commented on there is very often the sense of not wanting to burden family um and having a hard time being cared for because of that sense of like i don't want to burden them in their lives they're so busy they may have kids of their own and jobs and here am i uh here i am and i think sarah you mentioned that other part which is that oftentimes the adult children then take on the role of parent in ways that are not helpful and are often perceived as uh sort of demeaning or degrading to the parent of course mostly non unintentionally of course um uh, and so it can take on forms of ageism which uh is almost always unintentional as well but it's sort of assuming that i know what's best for you telling you what to do uh, i had a i had a client patient recently uh for a long time who lived with her adult daughter and the son-in-law did not want her in the bottom downstairs so she was stuck in a room and because of her physical stuff she couldn't come downstairs on her own so she was basically in sort of a you know uh house arrest that's you know one way to say it but her other kids would be like what's wrong mom why are you so bummed all the time you live in a nice place you're safe they feed she had no hand in no ability to even make herself a cup of coffee 
And that was completely unintelligible to her adult children who of course loved her. So um, there, yeah, there's a very, can be a very big disconnect in understanding each other's worlds, so. Yeah, that's why what matters really matters. <laughs> Finding out what matters for the patient. Yeah, any other, oh, other countries give stipends to family members who care for patients. Actually, some, um, I think some insurance companies do that too. Here they, they do, it's called um, self-directed care or something like that. And they can you know, give money to their family or friends and they can be paid a stipend for doing some of the caregiving. Yeah, to lessen the burden. But yeah. Yeah, caregiving is rough. Okay, any other thoughts or stories of some patients that you know that highlight any of these uh, issues here? You know, not, not, on, not infrequently, right? I get patients who come into the nursing facility and they have very, very well-meaning spouses who have been meticulously handling their diabetes regimen and checking all their finger sticks like <laughs> constantly, you know, and, and trying to regulate their blood pressure constantly and making them like crazy, right? From their micromanagement. And, and, and then when you talk about trying to cut back, they, they go crazy on you and they think that you're abandoning them, you know, finding bad care. Um, but it's, it's really needing to share with them some of these um, guiding principles, like, you know, the prognosis, you know, what is their prognosis and what is the time to benefit and really needing to share that. Yeah. Mahe, do you have a comment? Hi, Dr. Wen. Hey. <clears throat> Thanks for your talk today. I was wondering if in the prognosis calculator, um, assisted living, if that falls in the nurse group category or? You know, I don't know. I'm going to go look under calculator, under list, and see. I tried both for the patient I'm thinking of. Um, you know, assisted living is such a funny thing because... It's not, it's kind of a black box, right? Some people in assisted living are really, really need to be in the nursing home side, mm -hmm. right? And some of them yeah. are actually really quite independent. So, you know, so I think, I guess, may, make it more like under the living in the, the what you think they are more like. Sure. Yeah. Community. Sure. I would more like that but they okay. have different you know under living in the community they have ones where there's um uh there's something it says 15 month mortality and there's another one with three-year mortality so the three-year mortality is the carry three-year index and so that mm -hmm. has uh let me see it has different uh so you can pull up um yeah different questions actually sure. so just uh, just do a quick share screen and you can take a look here. I'll wait here. Yeah. So yeah, so I can look under calculator, make a list. And if I think they're actually pretty good, right? Three-year mortality, I can do the carry three-year index. And then there's these questions. Mm. Right? But if I think that they are more like, I'm thinking more like a 10 year mortality, then there's different questions, right? So even under the living in the community is a very wide range. Here's a 14 year mortality and medium life expectancy. This is a combined Lee and Schoenberg index. 
um, this one is mortality and disability prediction. So you can actually go through each one and see which one you think applies to your patient. This one is living in a nursing home as a six month mortality. There's a one year mortality. There's one for long stay residents and there's one for newly admitted nursing home residents, probably more like SNF. Um, hospitalized as a couple. This one is one on what is their mortality upon discharge? And this is their mortality upon admission. And then there's different, and then the hospitalized patient seen by palliative care, then that's the palliative performance scale, right? Over there. Yeah. It's a lot of information. Thank you. Yeah, so it's kind of crazy. There's So you can just do the generic one and pick one and they'll pick one for you, or you can go to the list and see which one. And I think it makes more sense, especially if you have the community and there's a very wide range, you can pick whichever calculator you want to use. And actually, if you go down each calculator, um, like, I don't know, like if you do this, I'm just gonna do that. Uh, oh, well, I have to answer more questions, oh, okay. Right. Oh yeah, they can tell you it tells you information about how the index was developed. It was done among this many long-term care residents in Missouri, and it was validated in this and this. This is their discrimination and the calibration and the citation. If you want to actually look at the article and any independent validation, so yeah, so these are all been um, published, you know, in peer review journals and, you know, statisticians have poured over these things and you can look at the, the and you could see these indexes, uh, these different calculators uh, and you say, oh, their N was really big or their N was like even huger or small, then you can sort of say, well, I think this is pretty good or not. Or you could do a few of them and then get the average, I suppose you could, you know, but this at least gives you a ballpark. This is, I mean, and every, and you have to remember that everybody's an individual, right? Some people have more stamina than others and others kind of give up easily, right? So um, yeah, everybody's different, but this gives you at least a ballpark of where you think, you know, a jumping point for where how to talk to your patients. Uh, average length of stay in independent living before needing assisted living. I don't know. Sarah, you're mute. Um, your your under your mute button is on, Sarah. Oh, sorry. I was I was just curious because people that go into uh, assisted living usually will try to go in on the independent side, right? Yeah. And as you were saying, and I think even um, uh, I wonder if Mahila is thinking there must be some average length of time before people start to need assisted living even though they probably don't think they need you've got the group that kind of really needs it because now they're needing help with medication management they're asking the neighbor to pre-fill their you know pill box or something I don't know and then you've got the yeah so that's if that's medication management versus um someone that need more help with personal care but I just I was just curious because I'm I'm sure it's somewhere out there, but that would be a good tool when you think about these guiding principles to start having conversations. Yeah. So yeah, take it with how accurate are these, you know? They're just numbers. Mm -hmm. People are people. I would just use it as a estimate and then, yeah, make your own judgment. Other, anything else people want to share? Okay, let me stop sharing. Yeah, if you have a chance, explore these uh, e-prognosis things. They're kind of interesting. Um, Okay, so thank you, Michaela. So evaluations, 
If you want any CMEs, you gotta fill out the evaluation form. So just uh, click on the link. And uh, yeah, and don't forget, you know, share these, you know, when you do these, when you take care of these complex patients, you know, think about all the different principles and think about their, what matters most to them and their quality of life and how feasible it is and, you know, all that, so. And make sure you share it with others too, because all our hospitalists also need to know, right? And all of our other providers out there. And of course the team, the interdisciplinary team is gonna be key in helping us figure out all this stuff as well. Thank you everybody.